Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my FinTech Tech Talk. So um, today we'll be going through what FinTech is, um, why it's important, um, and how it's changed over, well, hundreds of years, and what FinTech might look like tomorrow. So to kick off, we'll start with what's FinTech? Well, it seems like a good good starting point. So FinTech described here is computer programs and other technology used to support or enable banking and financial services. Um, not the greatest definition. There's actually a better one from Investopedia. So FinTech is the portmanteau of financial technology that describes an emerging financial services sector in the 21st century. Since the end of the first decade of the 21st century, the term has expanded to include any technological innovation in the financial sector from financial literacy through to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Now, everybody thinks of fintech. They think about things like blockchain, Bitcoin, challenger banks, Starling, all of that type of stuff. But first, we're going to talk about sticks. So, fintech isn't really new. Um, money itself really is a form of financial technology. Um, it's a way of assigning value to goods and services in order to exchange value. Um, so I think one of the key things to, to remember when you're thinking about fintech full stop is that you know, financial services fintech is fundamentally all about money. And money itself is entirely, in of itself, valueless. The amount of value we assign to a commodity, whether it's money or something else, is really entirely arbitrary. So what people had to do was create technologies that facilitated free trade and helped to denote value. So one of the great examples of early fintech is the tally stick. So in 1834, the British government decided to destroy 600 years of precious mo monetary artifacts. And it was a decision that was to have unfortunate consequences. Remind you of any recent news? British government destroying a load of things that could be useful in the future? Anyway, these artifacts were humble sticks of willow. Um, and they were known as tally sticks. Now, tally sticks were ways of recording um, debts in, uh, in the financial system. So what, what would happen is you would write on the stick uh, the, de the debt between the person that was the debtor, which was known as the foil, and the creditor, who was known as the stock, hence the term stock and trades. Um, and that, that, that stick would be put in half. And because of the nature of the willow tree had very, very specific signature to the wood, you would have to have both parts of it to form the whole tally stick. And obviously, the person who owned one part of it was the creditor. The other person who owned the other part of it was, was the debtor. Um, what's really interesting about this is actually that it enabled something quite radical. So, for example, if you, Katie, had a tally stick showing that Bishop Bassett owed you five pounds, and then unless you were worried that it wasn't good for the money, the tally stick itself was therefore worth five pounds. So the tally stick becomes a form of currency, not just a representation of who owed who what. So therefore you can accept the tally stick as a form of payment. So something effectively worthless, like a stick, can become a way of storing and exchanging value without the need of a central authority to arbitrage or to agree that this was this person owed that person this amount of money or that amount of money. The idea of decentralized systems where you don't need somebody in the middle to decide and make decisions sounds very much like one of the biggest fintech innovations of the last 10 years, which we're all talking about today, but its precursor was the tally stick. I would like five pounds of chickens, please, in exchange for this that stick. Person would get a stick. Like, exactly. Would that stick still be worth five pounds? It would be, because if that person presented that stick back to the bishop and said, I now want the five pounds that you owe me, the bishop right. is was, was was required to then pay that money. You still obviously have to go to the original um, debtor. Well, yeah, well, eventually it comes back. Um, but it's the, it's, the, it's the idea that, uh, in the same principle, that my, my pound coin, I could go back to the, to the British government at some point and say, I want you know, one pound's worth of gold for this pound coin, right? Nobody's ever going to do it. Um, but it's the same principle. That, that all, all the money is, is a signifier, it's an arbitrator of an un, some kind of sense of underlying value. So, 
This isn't that the tally stick's actually relatively modern in terms of financial technology. So to go back to some of one of the most early ones, so you're looking at about 500 AD here, we have the Ray Stones. Now this is a um, Polynesian island um, called Yap, uh, and they found large limestone deposits off the island, and these were very valuable. So what they used to do is they used to get in their boats, they used to go out, and they used to go and mine all of this, and they used to turn them into these big, massive discs. And those discs were very much prized amongst, uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst the villagers. What's really interesting about this is, as you can see, probably not the most practical form of money. So what happened was, is that especially for the larger ones, they brought them over, dumped them on, on an island, and then when something large amount of money changed for hands, say it was a dowry for a marriage or something like that, what would happen is the money wouldn't actually change hands. All they would do is go, so that used to belong to, to John, but now it belongs to Kevin. So the idea is that the money didn't actually change hands. All it was was everybody agreed that John didn't own that now, Kevin owned it. And if you think about how money moves today in banking systems, you all have the, the idea that if I paid Rose, my bank would send money from my bank to Rose's bank. That does, that's not how it works at all. All, ha all that happens is Rose Bank says, you've got five pounds. My bank says, you've lost five pounds. Money doesn't move anywhere. All it is is saying that the amount has changed nominally based on that individual. So it's, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting, some of the parallels. So as we skip forward, just running right towards modernity now, and we're getting towards the Crusades. So um, just uh, this is about 1100 AD. So let me know if I'm going too quick for anybody. Um, the Crusades um, was interesting because what happened was as the, um, as the knights got further and further into uh, new territory, let's say, um, they um, ran out of money and it was really hard for them to get more money to buy things. So what they had to depend on was a old Islamic um, tradition of being able to send money called Hawala. Um, and what it involved was basically, um, if you were in, you know, if you're two different destinations, you know you're going to be, let's say, you're in Istanbul one day, and the next day you're going to, in a few weeks you're going to be in Baghdad. You need that money to be in Baghdad, or you have people in Baghdad. What you do is you talk to somebody in Istanbul who would then talk to a creditor um, in Baghdad who would then make that money available to you when you got there. And it's one of the first forms of an honour system within money. So there was no legal basis to it. It's just they all, people within the network, trusted that that money would be then made available w when you got there. And again, you have lots of parallels with how modern financial services work. Or if you look at new models around um, social trust, whereby you are given more access to different types of financial services based on um, your sort of kind of social equity and your trustworthiness. Or I suppose actually credit rating is a much better example in terms of how that kind of trust model works. So again, we're getting we're getting really going really rapidly now. We're on to 1865. This is the Pan Telegraph. This is an early form of fax that allowed you to send between countries a signature to prove that that person was the person who signed that banknote, for example. So as we move forwards, we get into some of the more um, the ones that everybody's a little bit more familiar with. Uh, wire transfers first started in 1918, um, and that used Morse code to represent. Um, uh, money uh, that could be transferred between banks. Then we get into something which I suppose we've all become a little bit more familiar with. 1951, the first credit card issued by Diners Club in the US. Interesting story about how that came about. Um, Frank McNamara, the co-founder of Diners Club, was dining with clients and realised that he'd left his wallet in another suit. His wife paid the tab, and due to the intense embarrassment of this gentleman being out with all of his friends and his wife having to pick the tab, um, he decided that he didn't want this to ever happen in the future and that he would um, create some kind of virtual store of money so that he didn't have to worry about carrying cash again. Fast forward. First internet, sorry, uh, first electronic um, method of uh, transfer uh, of uh, trading. Uh, so this is the Qu Quotron was the first financial data company uh, to deliver stock market quotes to an electronic stream rather than a ticker tape. Um, and, and again, interesting fun fact: this was one of the first screens that displayed two types of colours. Originally, it was only um, black and white, but this had green text on a black background. So. 
pretty pioneering, as they can say. This was 1960. This, this chronology does have a point. I'll come to in a second. Um, then we have the first ATM um, in Enfield. Yeah. As I'm sure you already know, Chloe. Uh, so that was 1967. And I just love the explanation from John Shepard Barron, who invented it. It struck me, sorry, it struck me there must be a way I could get my own money anywhere in the world or the UK. I hit upon the idea of a chocolate bar dispenser, but replacing chocolate with cash. Interesting, um, interesting explanation there from, uh, from, 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 from John. Uh, and then finally, um, I suppose sort of one of the last biggest leaps in terms of financial technology, we have the, uh, the online bank. 1983, a lot, lot um, longer ago than I think most people would, would think. So this was from the Nottingham Building Society. Uh, it was called Homelink, um, and it was available to actually a relatively small number of high uh, net worth customers, and I believe these terminals were between 12 and 15,000 pounds. So if you wanted to operate your banking from the comfort of your, uh, comfort of your, of your desk or your sofa, it cost you a pretty penny. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that consistently technology has created ways of more easily exchanging value between counterparties and has given rise to new types of finance. Technology and finance are inherently symbiotic. One spurs on the other and vice versa. Um, I think it was uh, Keynes, the economist, who first wrote a paper in these things, the early 20th century, talking about how over time you can see how the two are kind of feed each other to a certain extent. So after the 1980s, however, despite if you think about all the technological enhancements that happened, there were few major innovations. And that was until 2008. What happened then? Ah, the financial crisis. So, in 2018, the subprime mortgage crisis precipitated a financial crash that resulted in a global recession. Um, fundamentally, at fault were reckless banks disguising bad debt by packaging it and diversifying it with other more healthy financial instruments. So I'm sorry if you guys all know about this, but um, the simplest explanation is effectively they wrapped in some really, really bad debts with some good ones to disguise them. Um, a lot of those instruments were called credit default swaps. Uh, we got quite famous at the time, um, and that created systemic risk in the system where people defaulted, the instruments lost value, and billions of pounds were wiped off financial markets. Enter fintech. So the first time the word fintech was used was in the 1980s by the editor of, uh, or the business editor of the Sunday Times, but he referred to it whilst talking about email technology. So nobody's really sure whether he actually was putting the words financial and tech together or he just had some kind of weird typo, splurge, or something like that. But when it started to become used a great deal was um, just before and then immediately after the um, financial crash, and particularly around the amount of money that venture capitalists were pouring into startup organizations which were focused on delivering financial services. Um, and as you can see, quite a lot of money. So this is only going from 2010. It's actually hard to get figures for, from earlier. Um, but you're looking at in the region of you know, 100 billion US dollars being poured into financial technology since 2010. So um, it's had a great deal of investment. So why has fintech seen such hype, seen such investment? There's a few different reasons. <laughs> the first one is, let's be honest, people don't like banks. Um, they may trust them, but they don't really like them. When people talk about uh, having a relationship with their banks, um, sometimes you hear this talked about in the media or even sometimes from clients. I don't think anybody really wants to have a relationship with their bank. Banks are very much a necessary evil. They would like their bank to get out of the way and allow them to conduct their lives in as, in as easy a fashion as humanly possible. A point will come back to you right at the very end. Um, but fundamentally, along with this, we, we had at the time bankers' bonuses. We had LIBOR rate riggings. Banks were the enemy. Um, and consumers and governments were interested in helping alternative financial services and financial institutions thrive. What else, what we also had a massive change in consumer behaviour. So this is, I think, um, this is this is Rome. Uh, I think this one's like 2009, and that one's like 2013. It's not even that recent, but you know, everybody's got their phones out, as we're, as we're all pretty used to these days. Um, Banking has been starved, really, of innovations. Given internet banking was invented in the 1980s, it's quite hard to identify any meaningful technology change really in the 90s and in the O's. I mean, we're still using credit cards, which were invented in the early 1950s, right? I mean, things haven't moved on that quickly. 
in juxtaposition, there was accelerated change in consumer technology, primarily driven by the mobile phone. If you think about it, in 2007, Steve Jobs gave the world the iPhone. A year later, banks were gearing up to wipe billions of pounds off people's investments and savings. Financial technology in the banking sector really wasn't synonymous with the idea of innovation. So financial technology driven by banks was basically failing to keep up. So what you also had was a wonderful David versus Goliath story. So a host of startups had sprung up looking to offer everything to consumers from loans to payment services. They were kind of the hot young things were looking to take on you know, these big, selfish, potentially in some regards, bad organizations. Um, and a lot of these were digitally led, they were mobile centric. And a great example is, is M-Pater, non-bank service, uh, helping to drive financial inclusion um, and it uses money, and it's one of the most successful examples of fintech to date. Um, but it's a perfect sort of microcosm of what I think people around the world were looking for at that time. So as, bank, as banks creaked under this sort of socio-political pressure, running cap into hand to governments to be bailed out, uh, these startups, you know, seemed effectively poised for greatness. These could be as big as banks. These could be worth a lot of money. Those are. 1960s IBM mainframes. Last year, Financial News reported 92 of the world's top 100 banks still use these mainframes. That's a lot of banks. That's a really old mainframe. That's a cassette. <laughs> this is how, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a rubber sole, actually. Um, yeah, it was the 60s. Anyway, um, so <laughs> that, if that's the reality that sits within banks. One of the, one, another one of the reasons for the, the uptick in investment and the interest was effectively a lot of these banks had to plug holes in their systems to be able to do the things that the government's consumers wanted them to do because they're relying on these horrible legacy systems. And you had a load of fintechs who had new technology that they could be used to plug in those gaps. So yes, some of it was we're out to take the bank's lunch, but there were a whole host of organizations out there going, there's a lot of money to be made here if I go and help the banks out. So one of the biggest things, other than Impaser, that came from this era in terms of fintech was the blockchain. And it would not be a fintech presentation if I did not mention the blockchain at least once. So um, you're sure you're aware of it. Um, there's an explanation there. Fundamentally, it's a decentralized uh, network. Um, or, or actually, I suppose more accurately, it's a, it's a ledger. Um, whereby effectively um, everybody who uses um, you know, a blockchain network, or it's probably easier to talk about Bitcoin as the most famous example of a blockchain-based um, currency or technology, everybody who wants to use a Bitcoin has to have the Bitcoin ledger on their own computer. And every single person has, uh, therefore, a store of who sent money to who. Once somebody makes a transaction, every single ledger on that entire network is updated. Therefore, there is no single point where, say, a bank says, Sarah owes Katie this much. We all know Sarah owes Katie this much because all of our ledgers have been updated at the same time and in real time, which also means the blockchain is impossible to defraud. So why is it kind of a perfect distillation of, um, of, of, of sort of the sentiment post-financial crisis? Well, control. Disillusioned with governments and banks, insurers, etc., the blockchain created a way to decentralize control. Technology, in the world of BitTorrent and Napster, if you think about where we were at that time, people were applying a P2P method um, to money, which enabled things to be faster, digital, and a better way, fundamentally, of moving money. At that time, you were still relying on Western Union to wire it from one country to the other in you know, a certain period of time, which may not have been clear for a certain amount of money, which also may not have been clear. Um, also, security. The distributed ledger is immutable. No naughty bankers can put the fingers, their fingers into this particular till. And finally, it's democratic. Anyone can create a currency. Like a ray stone, people have the power to invent new ways to exchange value free from establishment cor um, corruption. So, fintech yesterday, how do we really want to categorize it? Um, well, to start answering that question, I shared with you an 1858 illustration from the French newspaper Le Monde, 
of a Ling Chi execution of a French missionary, Auguste Chapardin, in China. The reason for doing this is the execution was uh, that the method of Lin Chi execution is known as a death of a thousand cuts. And that was really the approach of fintechs early um, in, the, in the growth of the sector. So rather than going for very sort of complex, uh, highly regulated, high barrier to entry areas of finance, or finance like pensions or mortgages or capital markets to a certain extent, what they went for is low entry underserved segments where they knew they could deliver uh, better products, um, digitally enabled, for a better price. So what, what, what really fell was payments, lending, wealth management. And most of the most successful fintech startups you have heard of today fit into one of those three brackets. Um, the most successful one that most people have heard of is TransferWise, of course. Again, um, fintech presentation without mentioning TransferWise is, uh, is a bit of a misnomer. So. TransferWise attacked international money transfers, an area dominated by banks who were delivering a subpar, slow, manually driven service, which was inordinately expensive um, based on the actually underlying costs. Um, so TransferWise took everything, everything we've just talked about in terms of the distaste for banks, the desire for change, and poured that into a media onslaught where they created a campaign. Um, so this, I believe, is uh, outside um, the Royal Exchange in London. Um, they did various protests right the way across the city. Uh, they've mocked up buses all about how much money bankers have taken uh, out of people's pockets based on international money transfer. Um, and effectively created a course, created a crusade around it. Um, although TransferWise grew quite quickly, it was later discovered that actually the P2P model that it talks about, the way that it does things different to the banking world and the way that it you know, presents a fresh new look is actually kind of a bit of a lie. Um, most of the transactions that TransferWise processes go through actually normal bank rails. Um, it fundamentally, TransferWise worked out that if it was going to deliver on its promise, it actually couldn't deliver based on this new model that it talked about. So actually around the 2012, 2013 time, a lot of fintechs was going out there to go and disrupt the entire system we're kind of coming to terms with the reality of what that actually looked like. Which brings us to FinTech Today. FinTech Today is more about collaboration than competition. So the slide there just sort of looks at all of the big banks, um, big global banks and what they're doing from acquiring uh, fintech companies to setting up venture funds to fund fintech companies from setting up accelerators to simply partnering them, for example. Um, so the reason for this is that it became quite clear that these startups were struggling to do it alone. Most financial services are based on selling low margin products to many. Look at something like payments, right? To do that, you need scale. Startups do not have scale. So whilst the fintechs have the technology, the banks have the scale and the distribution. Conversely, the banks need the technology. So the two work quite well hand in hand. So rather than it being a sort of a running battle, it was more let's run together hand in hand through fields of wheat. <laughs> what does the fintech landscape look like today? Um, I searched for quite a while to find a diagram which I thought act accurately sort of depicted, but this was kind of the best one. Um, so we've got lending, personal finance, so helping you to make your savings, your investments go further. Payments is a massive area, I think it's the largest area of all of them. Uh, equity finance, um, so you're being able to invest in businesses. Uh, Remittances, I mean, again, is effectively a form of payments, but has got a category of its own due to the um, intense nature of the, of, of, of the fintech investment in that area, based on the fact that, again, there's a lot of money to be made because banks have been doing such a bad job of it for such a long time. Institutional investing, retail investing, right way through security infrastructure, crowdfunding. Um, and this area here, online banking, is very small here, um, but it should be much larger. So I think one of the biggest changes in the, in, in, in the last few years is you've actually seen new banks, not fintech companies doing one thing or helping to provide technology to those banks. You're seeing brand new banks born um, who are doing things in quite a different way. One of those banks, it's Starling Bank. Um, and what Starling Bank has done is it's taken one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest challenges uh, to the market at the moment, something called open banking. Um, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have not. Open banking is the way that we refer to a particular kind of regulation here in the UK. In Europe, it is known as something called PSD2. 
And what the regulation is trying to do is effectively two things. It's trying to level the playing field in the market to drive innovation and also therefore to drive competition. And the way that it does that is it's forcing up um, incumbent banks, the big four or so that we know in the UK, for example, to open up their systems so that third parties can have access to our customer data. So that, for example, if I want to apply for a loan or a new bank, for example, um, all that organization needs to do is connect to my existing bank and based on my actual financial usage, come back to me and give me a decision um, in terms of what they can provide. No more filling out forms, for example. You get my, my actual data immediately provided to you. What it also does is allow people to actually transfer and, and pay from their bank account, not using their credit card, which is a massive change in the way that payments works, actually going outside of the world of Visa and MasterCard, for example. But kind of going back to the overall market structure, what Starling has done in the very much the spirit of um, collaboration is that its marketplace is open to other fintechs. So if you go and become a Starling Bank customer, there is a button. I am a Starling Bank customer. There's a button. You press marketplaces. And all of a sudden, a range of different service providers appear. Pension providers, insurance providers, etc. All those people you can sign up with with one click of a button because they already know that you're vetted, you're KYC, sorry, know your customer from a compliance perspective. And they already know that you probably have the money to be able to take on such a service. It is genuinely a very useful progressive set, um, step in terms of financial services. And obviously, these startups are leveraging the distribution and the network that Starling Bank has. So if that is fintech in the past and fintech today, what's fintech tomorrow? This is my guess. I think it's going to be something on the lines of co-opetition. So if it was competition before, and it's collaboration now, it's competition next. So while the industry has become more collaborative, challenger banks and lending and payment players are still, you know, still challenging the larger banking organizations. There is competition in the market. But Facebook, Amazon, Google, etc., they have all, in some ways, launched some kind of financial product. Amazon being the most high profile, where earlier this year it um, announced that it was in conversations with uh, Chase Bank in the US to be able to launch a uh, debit card to allow people to spend more freely on Amazon. Um, on the other side of the planet are the Chinese internet giants. So we have the likes of Ant Financial and Tencent who are busy investing and expanding westwards. Banks and fintechs kind of have a common, common enemy now and need to work together to really take on the might of the big Silicon Valley players and the big Chinese players as well. And I think it's worth just dwelling for one second on what actually Ant Financial looks like. So people probably heard of these organizations, but you probably don't know too much about who they are, what they do, or the rest of it. It's hard to overstate the level of change in terms of financial services structure that businesses like Amp Financial are going to bring to the market. So it is firstly the most valuable fintech in the world. It is 150 billion in valuation. That is, I think, one of the most valuable companies. It's not even public, right? This is a private organization, which is quite unprecedented for a Chinese organization. What does it do? It does medical services, it provides uh, tools for schools, financial services, public welfare, dining, gaming, online shopping, transportation, mobile top-up, credit, money transfer, daily household services. It is also a retail store. So what it does is it turns banking and financial services um, from away from being something in of itself to being something that's part of more of a kind of a lifestyle app where you can do all manner of different things, all underpinned by financial services. So effectively, banking and finance becomes part of your lifestyle rather than a separate activity or entity. It becomes invisible. It just helps to facilitate your life and make things easier. So we think at the very start of the presentation, kind of what everybody was looking to achieve originally with financial technology and the way that the world maybe went slightly wayward with, um, with, with, with the banks and, and creating specific financial products. It feels like we're going all the way back round to financial services effectively 
just being there to be allowed to allow us to be able to live the lives that we want to. And organisations like Amp Financial, which are bundling all of these manner of different services, from gaming to chat to broadcast, that's, I think, how we're going to see fintech change in the future. And you can already see how some of the Silicon Valley giants are quite well positioned to be able to start to replicate that kind of model. So, thanks for listening. <laughs>